This is the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and hitting subscribe on your friend's phone without them knowing. Coming to you from the kitchen studios in downtown Raleigh. This episode is sponsored in part by Spot On, tech that helps your business grow. Request a demo at spoton.com. And Joe Van Gogh Coffee, serving the community from seed to cup taking particular care at every step to honor the bean. And now, calling in sick to be here, it's Max Trujillo and Matthew Weiss. Hello, and thank you for listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. I am your co-host, Max Trujillo. And I am your co-host, Matthew Weiss. And Max, I had to talk to you today. I was literally blowing up your phone. I know. Because last night was the James Beard Foundation Award Show 2022. And let's just say North Carolina had quite the evening. Yes, this was awesome. We, we were trying to do all we could to get out there to the, uh, the old James Beard Awards held at the Lyric Auditorium, the Opera House out there in Chicago. Uh, just uh, was, it wasn't in the cards for us to get on that quick flight out there. But, man, we missed it. We missed a, a great one for North Carolina. North Carolina showed extremely well, not only in the regional awards, but in the uh, national awards, too. And we'll get into that. But we got to give kudos to our folks, we had so many great nominees in the Best Chef Southeast category. Uh, just in case you didn't remember who they were, we had Chef Greg Collier, former guest of the show of his Leah and Louise restaurant out in Charlotte. We had Katie Button from Curate. We had Chidi Kumar from Garland out here, just literally on the same block as our studio here. And then, most recent, former guest of the show, Ricky Moore, who was just on maybe a couple months ago from Saltbox Seafood Joint, took the prize and became the best chef of the Southeast 2022 for the James Beard Awards. Yeah. So happy for our man, Ricky Moore, who was on the show a few months ago when we did uh, Jason Gillikin's Earfluence podcast. As I think anybody who knows Ricky, this is well-deserved. That dude works hard. Uh, one of my favorite quotes ever is when we first talked to Ricky at Terra Vida, and he said, or we all said, Ricky's busy. Ricky got shit to do. And he does. <laughs> and that guy, but he does it so thoughtfully and so well. And uh, I just want to say shout out because I'm sorry, Greg Collier. I completely omitted your nomination from when we talked about it last week on the pod. But you are, of course, also nominated and well-deserved. And yeah. the guy that I was mistaken, Max... Also, that was, I also want to give a shout out because in a national award, he was nominated for um, best emerging chef. And that is our friend in this industry, but we hopefully will get him on the pod soon. Uh, best emerging chef, Cleefus Hethington. So I wanted yeah. to say a congratulations to him. And <laughs> Yeah, he was in the category where Edgar Rico from uh, Nietzsche Takaria took the, took the award, but Cleefus Hethington from Benny on Eagle, yeah, he, he's doing a, a bang-up job. And that leads us to you know Benny on Eagles out there in Asheville. Asheville, aside from Ricky Moore yeah. taking it out here in Durham, was kind of the big winner of the whole night, just the, the town of Asheville. Starting with the outstanding restaurant, you had a few different uh, restaurants out there, Butchers and Bee, Brennan's, Parachute, and the Walrus and the Carpenter, but who came out victorious? Chai Pani, which was yeah. amazing. And, you know, and they do such a good job. Their food is tremendous. I've been there once and had a spectacular time, but kudos to them. So awesome that they took it. And then when you're going around for also um, national awards, you're looking at best hospitality program. And that award went to Curate, Katie Button's Curate, yeah. also from Asheville. And I don't know if you <clears throat> you happen to see this moment, Max. It was pretty funny. If you follow the JBF awards, you know that Katie Button is uh, a multi-time nominee I won't call her a Susan Lucci of it because uh, she eventually won, but she didn't win. She's been nominated for best chef Southeast is what I say. But so she won for uh, outstanding hospitality, which is more of, I won't say it's a 
only front of the house award, but it's more predominantly a front of the house award. But I don't think she could have been happier. Like she was so emotional and it was a funny exchange. She got up there and she said, I don't know why I'm like this. I'm not usually very emotional, you know, and she was crying and in tears, but happy tears. And, uh, and then uh, Felix, her husband, who kind of runs the front of the house and her business partner gave this great speech. But then when um, Chaipani came up, <laughs> outstanding restaurant tour, it was a funny exchange. And I don't know, dare I say a little rivalry now brewing in Asheville, but he goes, uh, I am an emotional person. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you got that. No, but that's that, great but, though. But that, but that is great for Asheville. I mean, two national awards for that little town in the mountains. Yeah. And, uh, and we, we can't go without giving acknowledge to alley 26. They did oh, not win the bar program award. That's in a national award that went to julep, but they were rubbing elbows with Jose Andres's bar mini and attaboy. Nobody's darling. We were talking to Chef Kerry Schleifer and Shannon Healy of Alley 26 after Bubbles and Brisket. And, you know, it's cliche, but it's real when you say just being nominated puts you on the map and, and you win. It is true. And Durham got a big highlight with both the nomination for their bar program at Alley 26 and Ricky taking the whole thing for Saltbox. But man, like North Carolina lived up to the expectations that were set forth and really thrived. So, Kudos to everybody there. Now I have to go out to Asheville. We got to get out there and eat and chat. Got to go chat with our uh, our good buddy over at Devil's Foot Beverage Company, Bed Colvin. We're talking about doing a little Asheville week, so that's like mandatory now. It's coming. We got it. We got to get I don't out know there. If they'll see us now. It might be a little bit too big for their britches, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but yeah, I want to say a huge congratulations to Alley Twenty Six as well. And it's exactly what I told them. I was like, now you're on the map. And now you get to work at it all over again and uh, look forward to 2023 JBF Awards. Yeah. Well, everybody, this is a little bonus episode, so we are going to bid you a fond adieu early. But we've got uh, something really fun in store for you. Uh, We're going to take a quick little break. And when we come back, we're going to have a special episode from the untold stories of top hospitality titans from the new podcast, Office Talk which is a Raleigh Magazine podcast that just came out. And our good friend Gina Stevens, who's been on the show before and helped us with Bubbles and Brisket, and even uh, Jason Gillikin, that we mentioned before from Earfluence Media, who does a lot of great podcasts in the area. They put together this podcast, and it really highlights a lot of the local food and beverage scene in the area, at least in a specific episode. And uh, they may or may not have talked about Crafton in there somewhere. And uh, Eric Ginsberg, who's one of the writers, uh, helped Gina on that episode. So, as we bid you adieu, we'll uh, play this episode for you. You can download and subscribe on their platform, but you can click the links in our show notes so that you know how to get to it. If you haven't seen it yet, check it out. They'll be releasing shows every week. Eat and drink merrily, everybody. Thanks for listening to the NC f and Podcast. And if you've stuck with us this long, review us on iTunes and remember, five stars are encouraged. I may not be into this or that, but I like living in a city that has it all. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's nice about the chefs that we have in town and the restaurants that are here and are coming. That's part of what attracted me to live in Raleigh, honestly. I mean, I obviously care a lot about food, um, but even outside of my job, you want that sort of dynamic community where uh, if it was all one thing, I would grow tired of that pretty quickly. You're listening to Office Talk with Raleigh Magazine. I'm host Gina Stevens. You may know Raleigh Magazine, but what you may not know is how we get our stories. It's all inside baseball from living our lives and having conversations in our city. You'd be surprised what people will tell us. So this podcast is where we give you inside access to the behind the scenes scoop, things that were too hot to print or too much to fit in the magazine. Basically what's left on the editing room floor. So let's dive into the newest issue. With me today is contributing food writer Eric Ginsberg, and we're talking about his one-on-one interviews with Raleigh chefs. We devote a lot of pages in Raleigh Magazine to talking about the city's food and beverage scene. And because of that, a lot of chefs and bartenders give us the scoop 
are the first peek at what they're planning and opening. And in turn, we ask Eric to tell those stories in our magazine. Eric, welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Gina. I'm trying to remember. I think the first interview, big interview you did with us was with Ashley Christensen. Mm -hmm. That was set up to do a story about the cookbook that she and Caitlin had done, and it was being released during COVID. But you got a lot more than that. That's right. Yeah, I remember that very well because I hadn't lived in Raleigh that long. I still haven't lived in Raleigh that long. And so at the time, I certainly knew who Ashley Christensen was. Her name precedes her, but I had never met her before. And so I don't get flustered often. I've been a journalist for more than a decade, but I admit to going into that interview and being pretty nervous, especially because I had an ulterior motive. (laughs) (laughs) You did. I'd ask you, we had a few suspicions that she was going to make BB's more than BB's chicken, more than one or two locations. And I kind of said, I have it on good source, but I need you to figure it out. Yeah. So walking in there, you know, sat, we sat down at Poolside's Pies uh, with Ashley and Caitlin, and they were both very welcoming. It was a very comfortable conversation. I felt like I had known them for years. So they were pretty open with me, but that certainly put me at ease and made me feel more comfortable sort of saying like you would to a friend, you know, hey, is it true that you're expanding? And I remember her telling me that she was going to open an, or, or would love to open across the state and, and mentioned that her mom is in the Kernersville area and that she would want to have one there and several other places around North Carolina. And I think she even told you specific locations on a couple of them. You left, you called me and you go, I think we've got a story that we don't need to sit on. And... And we did. Yeah, that's to me one of the exciting things about journalism is that you can sometimes think you know what the story is going in. And then as you're in the process of working on it, it can completely flip on you depending on uh, what someone says. So that was a scenario where we, Raleigh Magazine published the news online first. And then we talked more about the cookbook in the the next issue of the magazine. You talk about being intimidating. Um, So... She agreed, and we photographed that chicken sandwich. She had photographed it and shared it on the website, but no one else had photographed it or seen it. And so she and Caitlin invited me and the photographer to her house, and on her front porch, she fried up that chicken sandwich for us and let us photograph the sandwich, and she and Caitlin together with the cookbook and the sandwich— And I can say, you know, there are a few moments in your career where you're a little intimidated. That was one of them, but we felt right at home. She walked outside. She had cooked extra chicken sandwiches. She wrapped them up for us, gave us a little to-go bag, which she had just bought a bunch of iPads for one of the restaurants. So we all walked out with Apple bags with chicken sandwiches in them. (laughs) It was pretty cool. I got back to work and everybody's like, okay, we have to eat that sandwich. We had to cut it up in little pieces because I was the first person to taste it. I love that. It, You know... I feel like a lot of times celebrity or um, celebrated restaurants like that, for me at least, I'm sure you've had this experience, they often don't live up to the hype. Or maybe I just, I'm so into food that I get so excited about it. And that has not been my experience with her restaurants at all. So I, you know, have to admit, I still haven't been to BB's, but my experience at Beasley's tells me that that was a pretty great chicken sandwich you had. It's a really good chicken sandwich. And I, and and even beyond the chicken and how it's prepared, I, to me, I'm all about the sauces. And the fact that she worked with Dukes and she worked with Tabasco and she worked with all of these different brands that we all know to create her own special sauces. It's worth trying. Pretty special. Yeah. I think you need to do that. Take your pregnant wife to get a chicken sandwich. <laughs> um, she would not object. <laughs> You know, in terms of celebrity chefs, the other one that you've interviewed for us, you met um, top chef Katsuji Tanabe. And when I met him, I had a weird, a weird, fun experience. We mm. photographed him for the magazine, announced he was coming to town. And I reached out to him to say, hey, do you have an opening date over text? And he said, what are you doing tonight? And I said, nothing. He said, bring a bottle of wine and meet me at the restaurant. I didn't know if I was meeting him by myself or if there were going to be 50 people there or anything. I didn't know if I could take someone. I show up and he's, the restaurant's done. He just hasn't opened. And there's this long table across the middle of it. And he's invited people that he's randomly come across that day. Wow. And he did this for a series of seven days. His team prepared every dish on the menu. I sat down at the table 
and he saved the seat directly across from me, which meant I had to try every dish. He came over and sat down and he walked me through each dish and how it was prepared, what it was. And, and you know, you're talking about a guy who's, you know, recently still on Rachel Ray in, in the mornings and he's got a, you know, some of the top restaurants in LA and Chicago. And I, I loved him. I liked him. We've turned out to be friends. He texted me the other day about his um, his new restaurant and said, hey, I'm going to bring tacos by the office for the girls. I mean, he's just, he's warm, but he's a big personality. I agree. So I've actually only met Katsuji when I sat down with him to do the interview for Raleigh Magazine. That was the only like real conversation I've had with him. But I wasn't living in Raleigh when he opened High Horse, but I happened to be in town over the holidays and we went out for a friend's birthday dinner there with a large group of people. And one of my friends there was geeking out um, because he he had watched, you know, every episode and was super excited. And Katsuji came and stood at our table for a while, took pictures, was super friendly. So on the one hand, I, you know, I can totally relate to the story you're telling. And on the other He's the kind of personality that if he walks into the room, all eyes are going to be on him. He owns the room. That's right. And I like that about him. I, I don't. You wouldn't want a city full of those chefs. I'm not sure how other chefs feel about him, but I can say that you know I've had a good experience. He's a lot of fun, mm-hmm. and and I think to open a restaurant in Cary, a Verde. I'm jumping around a little bit, but that opened recently, and I took some of my Cary friends who somehow believe that because I own Raleigh Magazine, I should know all the best places to eat. And so (laughs) I took them in there, and he sent out a round of shots for us to throw at the bell, which if you haven't done, you should do. Melissa and I did that when we went for the media dinner, and we were no good at it. (laughs) Um, I've seen the video. (laughs) (laughs) We missed the bell completely. (sighs) But he is. I mean, it's interesting to have... The juxtaposition between an Ashley Christensen, who's North Carolina native, versus a Katsuji. I love living in a city. It's like when I lived in Atlanta. I may not be into this or that, but I like living in a city that has it all. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's nice about the chefs that we have in town and the restaurants that are here and are coming. That's part of what attracted me to live in Raleigh, honestly. I mean, I obviously care a lot about food, um, but even outside of my job, you want that sort of dynamic community where uh, if it was all one thing, either end of the spectrum, I would grow tired of that pretty quickly. Yeah. Well, and I think it was pretty smart. You know, LM Restaurants, which owns everything from Vidrio, which is gorgeous, to Carolina Ale House, to Taverna Gora, had the foresight when City Mart, when, when High Horse was closed and Katsuji's moved his family from L.A., and they can't go back. We're in the middle of COVID. So they go They go to him and hire him as basically creative food director to oversee the food in their restaurants, which I think was super smart. Um, but I often wonder about the relationship between Katsuji and the chef at Vidria because their personalities are so different. Yeah, so Saif Rahman is the executive chef at Vidrio. And, you know, just speaking to him, it comes across right away how hungry he is and ambitious. But at the same time, he went through great lengths in our conversation to give a lot of credit to his staff and the people around him. Uh, so certainly a very you know, humble person, but his talent really speaks for itself. Well, I mean, he's um, in CRLA, so North Carolina Restaurant and Lodging Association's Chef of the Year for 2021. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of great restaurants in North Carolina for him, and and that was that's a pretty big um, an award to get. Yeah, that was actually what stood out to me most. I was when I wrote about him for the magazine. We were talking about a wide range of things, right? Not just uh, what he's doing in Vidrio, but sort of who is Saif as a person and as a chef. And what really jumped out to me was when he was describing the process of cooking for that competition and the extent that he went through to pull everything out of his own backyard here in Raleigh and his mother's backyard. She's also local. We hear so much about local, local, local that I honestly sort of ignore it when people tell me because it's lost a lot of its meaning. And also people have different definitions of what, you know, some places that means within 250 miles. But to see the chef himself pulling it out of his own backyard, 
I just love that. And I think we need a lot more of that kind of spirit. And he's a bigger personality than he comes off once he's comfortable. He came out to, we were having dinner with friends. He came out to the table and walked us through every dish and and what, he, and you could just hear the passion about how he had tweaked this dish tonight. Mm-hmm. Not not for the month. He had tweaked it for tonight. And I really liked that. I thought, you're really getting something special. It's not the same thing no matter when you go in there. He cares deeply about his work and about the experience of people that come into the restaurant. Um, I remember him telling me, too, that uh, if you've been to Vidrio, you know that you can look back into the kitchen. And I really usually think about that as a benefit for us, the consumer coming in, that we feel like we're part of the action. Uh, But he was telling me that he loves it because he gets to watch that moment when someone is lost in conversation with whoever they're sitting there with and they take a bite of food and they lose track of what they're thinking about. And so uh, it just changed the way I think about that sort of open concept kitchen. Well, and to be honest, when Vidrio first opened, I went there and and I'm probably going to be in trouble. I didn't care. If, I didn't love it immediately. But when he came back to the restaurant, because he originally helped open it, but I don't think he was head chef at that point. No. And when he came back and he made it his menu, um, there's nothing on the menu I don't love. It's it's delicious. Um, and, and it's an impressive. The restaurant itself is impressive. Um, but the presentation is incredible. We could go on and on about him all day. Yeah. But what's a lot of times what we're asking you to talk about are new concepts or chefs that are doing something like they're leaving downtown and doing something outside the area. That's been the case a lot. Mm-hmm. You interviewed Preeti for us. Mm-hmm. I'm really excited about what she's doing with Chini uh, Indian Food Emporium in North Raleigh. To be honest, it's partly because I live up in that part of town. Um, But also, I think that what we're going to see more and more of in, I don't want to call it the post-pandemic era, but since 2020, is that consumers want more than just a traditional dining experience, or at least there is much more of a space for that. And so what Preeti is doing with this iteration of Chini is so much beyond what we would expect from a traditional restaurant. And Uh, Speaking of Saif, she texted me from Charleston Food and Wine saying that they had linked up there. I guess they didn't know each other before, even though they're both chefs here in Raleigh. And he's going to be one of the chefs that comes and does a a guest night at Chini for their dinner series. So they... She's bringing in local chefs. She's also bringing in uh, really big names there for different educational type events. But I just love that Chini is going to be a more creative concept and that she is also going to be evolving the menu constantly. So I know that's opening soon uh, and I'm really looking forward to heading over there. Yeah, I can't wait to try it. And I do know that she she really is passionate about the experience that the diner is going to have as well. And, and I don't know all the details, but I know that she has uh, planned a, a media night where she doesn't want any of, typically a media night is all about getting us to take photos of your mm-hmm. food and the the atmosphere and post them and share them and build excitement. And she's really not doing that. She wants you to leave your phone behind at the front desk when you walk in <laughs> and experience the entire place and then go home and reflect on it and share it. It's an interesting concept. I, I, um, I can't imagine it's, it's different, but I think that it lends itself or leans into what her whole theme is with Chini. You know, that's really interesting. I didn't know until you told me that, that that's what she was going to do. And it makes me think the only time I can remember having to do that was going to a comedy show where they were doing a live taping for HBO. And it seems very counterintuitive, but that is exciting to me that someone is thinking that creatively. I don't know if that will work. I'm not the one to say, but I love that someone is thinking outside the box and trying something different. Well, and I, I absolutely agree with you. And I think that North Raleigh could could use an, an influx of some locally owned restaurants. There's some good stuff up there, but that area hasn't had the explosion and growth that maybe even West Raleigh's getting or certainly downtown. Yeah, I would certainly agree. There are definitely places up there that I uh, order takeout from very regularly. I love Spanglish and I get takeout from Typhoon Bistro more than I should admit, but I don't think there's anything like this in Raleigh at all and certainly not that part of town. 
Right. It's worth, it'll be worth to drive. Um, you and I have talked about it before. I think it's really interesting from an interview standpoint, the difference between interviewing a chef owner that's opening their first restaurant versus someone that's opening their third or fourth restaurant like Scott Crawford. Because you talked mm-hmm. to Scott when he was opening Crawford Cook Shop in Clayton. Yeah. Scott comes across as uh, very comfortable in his skin and in his career. I think he's really hit a stride in a way that, you know, I hope that for for younger chefs. Scott is sort of like the elder statesman of the food scene here in a lot of ways. He, he's the kind of guy that I feel like embodies, I, I'm wearing relaxed fit, <laughs> comfortable jeans with a little bit of stretch in them. And that to me is sort of Scott's personality. You know, on the one hand, he can be opening a, a high-end steakhouse in Fenton, but he's also opening Crawford Cook Shop, which is really bringing in some of the spirit of the small town in Pennsylvania that he grew up in. And so uh, the ability to do both is definitely something that I'm sure has come to him over time. And, and uh, like I said, it's nice to see someone who feels comfortable in, in where they're at and what that freedom enables them to do. And what I've heard from other chefs, young chefs who are getting started, is that he is more than willing to sit and talk and share. He's obviously very busy, but he is very forthcoming and easy with other people sharing his experiences and advice. Mm-hmm. And and I think that sort of mentoring process is something you, you can't get anywhere else from someone like him. Yeah, and you know, sometimes when you're interviewing someone, they're um, a little guarded with the way that they talk to you because you're press and maybe that's wise. But Scott and I had don't have a relationship outside of me interviewing him, and he was very at ease and and very forthcoming and candid, and and I appreciate that. That's refreshing to hear. And then to what you're saying about um, sort of being that mentor to other folks, it's slightly different. But I know when I was talking to some of the people that are going to go into Fenton and ask them what was it that convinced you to join this project. Pretty much to a one, they said it was Scott Crawford. You know, it's funny. That's one of my uh, favorite stories you've done as well, just because we call it we called it the Fenton Fab Five. Mm-hmm. And I joked in the podcast that we did about it that Scott should have gotten commission. <laughs> I mean, he really was the linchpin in getting everyone. Everyone was like, oh, Scott's going, I'm in. Scott's considering it, I'll take a look at it. You interviewed... Mike Lee and Kevin Barrett and Ford Fry. What do you think about Fenton and what they're doing? It's really interesting. I mean, I, for, listeners will remember the episode where you mm-hmm. discussed this with Melissa, but I think that there, in a lot of ways it reminds me of North Hills. But as you were talking about in that episode of the podcast, it's very different in terms of how they're approaching it from the beginning and the role that food plays. And I think that... Obviously, decades ago, food wasn't really considered a part of culture in the same way. We didn't have celebrity chefs to the extent that we do now. And this, to me, marks an, a further evolution down that uh, chain. I don't know if I'm mixing my metaphors here. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to see. I, I expect that a lot more developments of that size are going to try and replicate that model, especially with local and regional chefs. They, (laughs) Heinz is, I believe, a multi-billion dollar business that has interests in multiple countries and obviously all across this one. They definitely know what they're doing, at least when it comes to how to make money. And so if they're telling us that these chefs are the way to, to do it, and that's what you sort of hang your hat on, there's something to it. Well, and I think beyond that, I mean, if you think about when we plan our weekend, we're going to dinner here, then we're going to do this and this. We're going to have a drink here, and then we'll do this, this, and this. And I think that it is, it's the cornerstone of, of so much of our um, social interaction, and a lot of times it's about the location, but more often it's about the food we want to have or the drink we want to have, the experience we want to have. And I, I thought it was interesting 
you know, that they all talked about, they never would have ever dreamed of going into Mm -hmm. a shopping center, if you will. Yeah, I think there's a real stigma around what a shopping center is. So for me, I was born in the late 80s, so child of the 90s. The shopping mall was, and I grew up in suburbia, so the shopping mall was it. You know, it was next to the mall. It had everything. I was a hooligan at Hot Topic and Spencer's Gifts and harassing people in the food court. (laughs) Um, I can see that. Kids like me are probably the reason that malls like that don't exist anymore. (laughs) Or that have an age limit on when you have, how old you have to be to go to the mall. (laughs) But what you're saying resonates with me because what we really want is a sense of community and walkability, right? And you can get that downtown. But it's hard, really. I mean, outside of downtown, you don't have that level of walkability. So we live in a very car-centric culture. And so what's interesting about a concept like this is that you can go to dinner at one place and then go out for a drink or vice versa and have those different experiences without getting your car and driving between them, which you know, you can do, it's it's less so if you're drinking, but it also really, it takes something out of the experience if you have to stop, especially parking um, can be such a headache that giving people a whole evening that's more than just a meal, I think is going to be very appealing. When you did the story with um, Scott about Crawford Cook Shop, you were looking at chefs who had sort of, were making the move out of downtown that's right. um, you did a couple of chefs. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I hadn't picked up on this trend on my own, but you and the the rest of the team at Raleigh Magazine pointed out that a lot of people, including Jason Howard and Max Trujillo, were looking to get beyond city limits and open in some of the outlying uh, communities, both in Wake County and beyond. And, you know, I think it says so much in in many ways food is sort of that like leading edge of culture, right? And we talk about this mostly in terms of housing, but restaurants are going to lead the way as well. And I'm sure we're going to see other elements of culture expand to communities like Wake Forest. Uh, So I think what is happening with Crafton is particularly interesting because in some ways they're flipping the model of a food hall on its head. I, I haven't had a chance to get out there and try it myself, but just as a concept, like we were talking about, I love when people are thinking outside of the box and trying something new. Well, and, and Max has been a longtime friend and and I've been on NCFNB podcast and I love their podcast. It's all about food and beverage. If you haven't listened, you should check it out. But it is, I, I love the concept and, and Max is such a smart guy in that he looked at the business model of a you know, a food hall and went, what's what's the pain in the ass part of it? Well, it's going here and paying and going here and paying and keeping it, being able to control your own tab, but also wanting unique, really good food. And I think he's done a great job with creating that space. I have eaten out there and loved it. And their cocktail game is really good. Um, uh, they've done a great job and they're about, they're working on Clayton. They've got one mm-hmm. coming out of the ground in Clayton that will be open by, I think, by the end of the summer. You know, I tried to convince him to come to North Raleigh selfishly <laughs> uh, to have a concept a little closer to home, but, you know, he's convinced me I'm going to need to make the drive. It's not a bad drive. Yeah. I have to say, I think my favorite story you've done, and I've, I like them all because I keep reaching back out, or, or Melissa does, <laughs> but is called The Black Sheep Bartender, and I like Jason Howard. He's been a friend, and he also, I think, does some interesting things. Mm -hmm. He's definitely, they broke the mole when they made him. Mm -hmm. But Jason's the cardinal, pink boot, rainbow luncheonette. He's funny. uh, He's the first to say not everyone likes him, and he's okay with that. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, I, I wish I had more of that spirit myself. I'm trying Don't to care all? less about what other people think of me. And uh, he's a, a character. There's not another <laughs> better way to describe it. You know, his he's definitely himself. And again, another another person that I didn't had any interaction with until interviewing him for Raleigh Magazine. But his personality comes across loud and clear, uh, you know, from that first conversation. What's interesting about him is that he extends that to his businesses. And I think that if you're familiar with somewhere like the Cardinal uh, or some of his newer concepts that I was writing about for this piece, I think you know him even if you've never met him. It really seems like 
he wants to open places that are an extension of his living room or his front porch. It's a combination of no frills, no pretension, come as you are, a kind of attitude, uh, and also stay out of my way and let me be myself. Right. There's some of that energy too. If you don't like me, I don't care. Mm-hmm. And I kind of respect that. I guess I respect it a lot because uh, I don't have a whole lot of that in me. I'm trying, like you, work in progress. We rarely hear from people when they like something. We often <laughs> hear from them when they don't like something. And after this story, I probably had, dare say, 10 people reach out to me to specifically tell me that there was one paragraph in your story <laughs> that they loved. I mean, how random that that many people liked the same sentence, and, and, and I think it was really interesting. The sentence was, the country music blaring, domestic beer slinging, honky-tonk will be the smallest, weirdest bar in Raleigh, he said. The kind of place where Yuhu Vanilla Stoli and Godiva come together in just one of many trailer trash cocktails. I think people could just visualize what Pink Boot was going to be, and there's probably not a better description. <laughs> well, a lot of credit goes to Jason on that one because I was really just pulling different things that he said to me over the course of our conversation together uh, because that spirit came across when we were talking. Okay, so little rapid fire questions. Okay. Um, <laughs> what's your favorite restaurant in Raleigh? Your go-to. I do not have a favorite restaurant in Raleigh. Uh, I think I would be disqualified as a food writer if I did, but I will tell you some of my favorites. Okay, I'm going to tell okay. you, you're about to have a child. I get it. <laughs> I have four. I love them all equally, but I we all know you have favorites. So some of the ones you like more than others. I find myself going back to um, several places more more than most. So St. Rock, obviously. Um, not, I'm not unique in, in having that as a favorite. I'm really excited about Young Hearts Distilling. I think they're doing great things with the food, and I like the drinks a lot, too. Uh, y Hill has been very consistent for me, whether it's brunch or dinner. I love sitting on their patio. And same goes for Hummingbird. I think that they've they've got a great little spot over there. And I, I can pretty much order anything, even though their menu is relatively small. Mm-hmm. I know that I'm going to be be comfortable there. And then, of course, you know, all of the greats I mentioned early in our conversation that I was not let down um, by being at any of Ashley Christensen's restaurants. I still have not been to all of them. Um, but there is a real reason that she is as well-known as she is, uh, and it, it lives up to the hype. So uh, I would be proud to show anyone any of those places. I had a great experience at Cortez, and Garland is probably the place that I have been to the most out of anywhere else in Raleigh. I think there's something for everyone there, and I think it has uh, a spirit to it that you can't necessarily find at most restaurants in the city. Well, and if, and to interject before I ask the next question, if you think about it, you moved to Durham during COVID, and then you moved to Raleigh. And so mm-hmm. a lot of the places and experiences you've had have been with some COVID limitations on them. So to say that they still, you enjoyed the experience, I think is saying a lot. Okay, favorite spot for a drink? As you mentioned earlier, my wife is pregnant. So we've been looking for places that have good mocktail menus. And I I want somewhere that can do both. And a lot of places have a cop out on their menu when it comes to mocktails, which is unfortunate because obviously my wife won't be pregnant forever. But one of my best friends is sober. There are plenty of people that don't drink, including several of the chefs that we've mentioned. Right. So... I'm excited to see that there are more places offering that. The best experience I've had with it so far has been at Killjoy. Um, They have a, uh, it's still pretty limited mocktail menu, but what they do, they do well. The the dreamsicle drink there tastes just like a creamsicle. Um, Our bartender, Lisa, took great care of us. And I I did really enjoy the the regular cocktails on their menu, but I did find myself (laughs) thinking, you know, maybe I should order my wife's drink next because I was trying what she was drinking too. Interesting. So what is one spot or one chef that you maybe haven't eaten at or talked to that you, what's on your your bucket list for Raleigh? You know, it's embarrassing how many places I haven't been, honestly. Even though this is a big part of what I do professionally, uh, it's been a difficult two years for restaurants and to go eat at them. So uh, (laughs) there are 
a whole lot of places I still haven't been. You were talking about Jason Howard. He was nice enough to give me a key to Atlantic Lounge. I haven't used it yet. Jason, I'm sorry. We're gonna I fix will that. be there. You, yeah, um, we're going to fix that. <laughs> I have not been to Death and Taxes yet. I have reservations in two weeks to go to Jolie, but I haven't been there yet either. So there are a lot of places that, that I still haven't experienced. I hear great things about Stanbury. Got to go. Yes. So um, the, the list is long. But I would say also there are places that I'm excited about that aren't open yet. So we mentioned Chini. Chef Eric Ruiz is opening a Puerto Rican spot called Bendito. I'm looking forward to that. Right now, Fine Folk is, a, is soft launching or having a, a private event to launch. And then in the, in the current issue of Raleigh Magazine, I wrote about East Bauer Cider Company. Cider is not the first thing I reach for when I'm having a drink, but I'm really excited that there are going to be more options. And I think that it's great that people are changing the perception of what hard cider is and can be. Uh, this is not going to look anything like woodchuck or the the mass-produced hard ciders that you can find out there. And I think it's really interesting, too, that that there's going to be a full bar at East Bauer as well. So I'm really curious to see what East End looks like overall. And I will give a little plug. You are currently working on a story that's going to be in our May issue. You interviewed Giorgio yesterday mm -hmm. about some new concepts and once again got the scoop on something that no one else has, which... I will leave it that, but hopefully you'll uh, subscribe and pick up your May issue and read Eric's story. Thanks for coming in. Thank you so much for having me. This has been Office Talk with Raleigh Magazine. I hope after hanging out with us, you feel more like a Raleigh insider. You can find copies of our magazine around town or subscribe for $10 for 10 issues. We'd love it if you gave this podcast a rating and review and share it with your friends. This podcast was edited and produced by EarFluence. I'm Gina Stevens. We'll see you again soon.